Great. And so now for real, the talk begins. So, hello. So, for the technical um, mishaps. So, I'm Iris Yuan, and this is a joint work with Orestes, who already gave his first talk this morning, who are here, and with all the Swetra and our book at uh, Utrecht University. Um, so, I actually have a bit of a different background. I just started functional programming not long ago, and this is uh, most of the work by uh, Orestes. Uh, we worked together on um, building a music information retrieval uh, tooling with, uh, using Haskell, which was a uh, really nice uh, work done together. So I will start the talk with a bit more music information retrieval set of things, so uh, not overly musical. <laughs> um, so this is a, so we've seen lots of patterns, like graphical patterns, uh, different musical patterns, um, and there's a very, loose use of the language uh, pattern. Um, so I will just show an example what I mean uh, to the pattern here. So I ho hope you all agree that it's a very clear-cut pattern like one of our audience suggested in the last talk that uh, the issues has a really regular pattern just going uh, up and down. And let me try yeah. Um, so that was a very clear cut one, but in actual music analysis, uh, it's very different, sometimes very subtle uh, in folk music, in classical music uh, especially. Uh, minimal music is easier, uh, fugues, you have defined subjects, sometimes easier, um, but it's a um, very diverse range of patterns we have in music. It's sometimes called licks, riffs like motif sequences depending on different genres and different types of music. And people describe them in different ways as well, like a smallest independent particle in a musical idea, like by Weaver, uh, a structure unit possessing thematic identity uh, by John White, and a unit which contains one or more features of interval and rhythm, whose presence is maintained in constant throughout the piece by Schoenberg. So they're very uh, famous musicians. Uh, who describe different patterns this way. It's a very visual way of uh, identifying things. So, oh, that was <laughs> so easy. <laughs> okay. okay, that's going to be background music for this talk then. Um, yes, so search analysis can go very complex. Um, so when we have lots of notes, when um, the piece is really long, computation can really help. And especially we'll get lots of data of uh, lots of pieces that we want to analy analyze them at the same time. So um, it's helpful in modeling complex music in formulate uh, simple, sim simple ones. And indeed people have been trying. I think do a, a question about automating uh, musical pattern discovery. And there are algorithms based on geometric methods, string-based methods, and machine learning. And, um, it's not a solved problem despite all these efforts because we still at a place where different algorithms found lots of different patterns. So let me show you an example. Um, this is a visualization of uh, two algorithms running on the same piece. So you see the dots, then the notes, and they form the same um, arrangement. But two different algorithms give two different, complete different interpretation of where is the pattern. So. It's hard to tell which pattern you extracted is right or wrong. Uh, so the challenge is uh, here uh, is to model, extract, compare patterns given the oldest diversity of music and algorithm, and to interpret and use the results from uh, those automatic methods. And it's not easy because it involves so many things. Um, <coughs> disciplines as well uh, for perception, uh, conversion, music theory, uh, interaction uh, between the audience and uh, um, player, composer, and the disagreement between expert and um, algorithms. Um, so where we're starting from is this common theme that's been showing up a lot: uh, the repetition of variations has been all throughout the day today. Uh, that functional programming are very good at modeling them. And it's a show up everywhere in music uh, 
Theory and Musicology and is a Mushroom Tree. More specifically, we are trying to answer this question what constitutes a musical pattern by taking a more relative perspective. Um, so we look closely, uh, closely into how one occurrence relates to another occurrence instead of saying this occurrence is the correct one, this occurrence is not the correct one. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, is we look at the musical transformation. So here are some uh, visualizations, um, simpler ones from the transformation the composer use, um, commonly used, relatively commonly used. Uh, there are more subtle ones, but uh, um, those are very easily, uh, can be easily modeled with symmetries. So for example, if you split the y-axis, you've got retrograde, you've got flip back, and you've got inversion. If you move them around, you've got transposition, um, and you can stretch them and compress them in time convention, you get augmentation, diminution, and you can insert note and delete note uh, where you've got approximation, and you can compose all those transformations together. Uh, so see an opportunity for uh, compositionality. Um, um, so more specifically, uh, we have some musical data from uh, folk music, classical music. Uh, the acronym for MTCAN is a folk music data set. Uh, the Dutch folk songs and JKUPDD is a classical. We call them classical data set, but they actually based of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, and Beethoven. So different periods of music. Uh, they are symbolic, monophonic music with human annotated patterns. Um, it's actually really hard to find annotated patterns, so that's why we have restricted data set. Um, but we also have, um, so we need to have algorithms. That's from the Music Information Retrieval Evaluation Exchange, CUPMIREX, uh, where authors submit the algorithm to compare with each other. And so we have different pattern locations, and we try to compare them with Haskell uh, notation. So let me first show you some results that have concluded the story, uh, that what we found, and then we'll come back to the implementation. So this is the human notation for the classical ones. Uh, it's very interesting, actually, when you get this big pink wedge that you get. Uh, so those are the exact repetition. So um, the pattern occurrences can be related to the exact occurrences. Um, in the piece. And the, green, uh, the blue ones, they are transposed occurrences. Uh, they're different percentage sign, which is a, a parameter that I'll extend later um, to allow for different approximations. So you can insert node and delete node. And uh, this is uh, via human annotation. And if we go to algorithm, it's got lot messier and we didn't <laughs> expect that really. So for, first we see that there are lots less exact transformations, so exact repetitions. We thought algorithms, they should be consistent, like they discover lots of things, uh, the same things, but actually go much diverse uh, with lots of transformations, with uh, some transformation we can't even explain with the um, transformation we um, considered, and they got lots of pattern appearances as well. So it's, in some sense, the algorithm is more creative in what they extract as, as patterns. And if we compare, like put them side by side, the classical music data set with the folk music data set, we have a similar trend. So the first and third are the algorithms, and we got lots of complexity going on, and the second and fourth they are um, annotations. And, um, but across this set, we also see that there is a more diverse transformation composition in the folk data set. And we think it might be the case that the compositions in classical music they have precise notation that retains through those uh, piece, the, the sheet music, paper, other paper. But the folk music, they are retained through oral translation. Uh, um, so 
Yeah, that was the musical findings. Uh, now let's see some Haskell, how we did this in Haskell. Um, so here are some basic type, uh, depending on what kind of uh, data we have. So this is the data pattern occurrence um, structure we have. We have first the time uh, dimension and then the pitch, which is the frequency dimension. And we define them as time and MIDI. So MIDI uh, is MIDI number, is the integer representing the pitch. And then combining the time and pitch, we have the type as note. And the pattern we just define as a list of notes. And we define a pattern group. So that's where we relate different occurrences uh, with the transformations. So we have a prototype we take as a base pattern and we relate other occurrences with that prototype pattern. And finally, we define our check uh, with some checker that will be telling us which um, pattern is matching mm -hmm. with which one. Um, so the way uh, we did this um, is actually, so this is the more general way, uh, I suppose, um, that we have a data a constructor and a check and uh, example is just given anything we return true. But in the library, we actually use this new type, uh, more Haskell-y kind of way to check uh, the pattern occurrence. Uh, and there's a more uh, si a simpler one, uh, just defined type synonym, uh, but it's like the less safe. Um, so uh, so the, tr uh, the rest of the presentation, I will use this make check um, notation. And because we mostly compare pattern with patterns, we define also a home check um, just to uh, um, simplify the type signature. And an example will be just a normal equal um, comparison. And after defining this check, we uh, ideally want to combine the checks. Uh, so we just take a, a simple and uh, we'll combine them, and uh, the identity will take just a true checker to give us um, the ability to combine check, but now we want to match the check as well, uh, perhaps with one feature. So um, let's say we want to check the pattern space on just a reason, just the time dimension. Um, then this is actually, um, can see a structure here that if we want a checker for pattern type, we need um, the function from pattern to time and a time checker to have this uh, finally the home check pattern to define. So uh, probably people here are already familiar with uh, this contravariant idea, but I'm, I, w I was learning Haskell throughout this project. so. Uh, I was uh, learning the contravariant idea, which I thought really neat. Um, so in the more general case, this is actually borrowing from category theory, uh, contravariant by function. So if we have check with two type A and B, and uh, we vary the first type, uh, check C and B, um, uh, we, have, we want to have check C and B, then we need to control the F, go from a and A to C, uh, but we need to go back from C to A. So um, that gives us the first components of the control by map. And we also define, vary the second uh, type position, get uh, control um, G, and compose F and G, we have a control by map to give us the checker uh, C and D. And how we implemented this in Haskell. Uh, is just translating that idea from the diagram uh, to write in this type class and write an uh, instance for the check type here. And for home check, uh, we define this um, simplified um, inflex <coughs> operator uh, that basically follow from our control by map class. And now here's an example of how we check the exact rep uh, repetition. Uh, so we take the rhythm uh, feature and 
map them through the equal checker and compose with the pitch checker. And the pitch and rhythm are the uh, function, the uh, hardware function was defined that it trap happen to MIDI and where and happen to time. And the equal is just the example we showed before. And so that's a really strict way of checking just the exact repetition. Um, I said that we also want some flexible cases where you can see uh, some insert node and delete node. And here's uh, how we implement this in approximation. Uh, we, give, uh, we define this pet, which take a float uh, as a parameter to control the degree of fuzziness um, that based on a percentage score and if aspect a check. So putting everything together, we define a proxy check pattern um, that combining this inversion transformation shows you so the flip around going up and down. Then we have, uh, so we specify a this pitch and um, make them say that it has to be equal, combine them with a risen um, dimension uh, with the approximate check equal and check the intervals when they flip, they should be um, the same with each other uh, up to approximation. So this is putting everything together, we can combine the checks and dimension it this way, uh, modular way. So here's a list of transformations that we're considering. Uh, this is the visualization I just showed earlier. And uh, what's come after this for free actually is uh, querying and discovering uh, functionality, uh, which is really nice to have this kind of tool to check just manually what's being discovered by algorithms. So, and it's actually very easy to define. Uh, we just need to define a window size and uh, have a, a query um, and a music piece that we just define as a pattern and a basic filter uh, structure when the um, window is sliding through. We um, give it a checker and um, let it do all the work for us. So for example, uh, we can also, uh, we also implemented the Utopia functionality where we can query up to, um, so this is an example showing query up to transposition, um, where we can have Utopia uh, notation to query a certain note sequence C, E, G, C uh, as the first one. We can also query uh, through bar, that's, uh, the chord chat beat uh, 25 through 28 up um, to a certain type of uh, transformation. Um, so actually, I have some um, query results. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay, so if we do a query, a query here, uh, hope we can see. Yep. And then, oh, oops, is this the, yep. So this is the query, querying bar from the 21st to 28. And now we see, uh, we can generate um, the query results in MIDI. So let's have a look at the music. If I can show it here. Yeah. So this is the Bach music. And I can play just the first part. Yeah, so this is where we queried. So from 21st to 28, um, what chat beat is from the this bar. And so there's been some rendering, MIDI rendering issues with MuseScore that I'm experiencing. <laughs> but so this is the base pattern that uh, we just generated. Uh, and I'm just going to play with this <laughs> manually. <laughs> And it's, it's a tie, which is a really um, tricky issue. So this is what we queried. And uh, let's see what kind of pattern it returned to us. Um, this is just deleting the first note, actually, because we allowed for some insertion deletion of notes. So this is not very interesting. But this one, 
this one, let's see. Uh, let's start here. So you can see it's a similar tone. And you can see here, let's start from here. Yeah, and it goes on. Um, um, yeah, so we can see this kind of similar, but they're actually not exactly the same, even in terms of um, translation, because sometimes uh, there are a major second, and sometimes the beginning is a, a minor third. Um, so this is something quite interesting. And also, when I examine the algorithms that I show, so here are two instances that we got in our data. Um, that the algorithm or the uh, Haskell querying and an analysis tooling says we can't really relate them. So have a listen. I find it is a bit hard to read them as well, but it might be a more nuanced issue. So <laughs> it's a bit faster. Um, yeah, so there are similarities, but we can say for sure after checking that they're not related by the similarity we considered. So that provides us a starting point for more similar, uh, more further investigation in what kind of uh, relations this involve. Okay, so that's then Let me go back. Uh, so the conclusion is we followed a bit of category theory and Haskell in modeling and implementing a high order comparison um, of music patterns to compare the occurrence relations using these musical transformations. Um, so we found some implementation for music uh, that will have differences between music pattern discovery algorithm and Haskell annotations, and different different code graph as well. Uh, so we have our pattern query and discovery tool online, so if you want to try out yourself. And that will be the end of my talk. So just to clarify, um, yes. what you when you compare two things and say there may be instances of some pattern, mm -hmm. uh, these things are uh, sequences of notes. Yes. And not yes. necessarily sequences of other things like uh, uh, like chords, like how, no. how, how, yeah. how, how many progressions or something yeah. like that. So we're all only for now having those. Uh, Symbolic monophonic data, so we haven't considered the polyphonic piece. Uh, yeah. And how much is, was risen in part of that? How much was so we basically defined uh, the rhythm. Right, if we want to examine the rhythm, then we would say we want to um, augment or diminuate. So the augmentation and diminution are the rhythm related uh, transformations. So otherwise, the rhythm has to be the same. Yes. Okay. So it's sometimes a bit strict. But yeah, the last example, you know, it seems just maybe there's a missing note, like one note became two notes. Um, it's two. Huh? It's, it's two transformations. You lose a note, and then you put it in major transpose. Okay, and maybe the putting, is that first step missing? Is that is that why there's no relation between these two? Like, what? Um, like, so, why? Why? so this is the first one? Yeah. So if you play it really slowly, then you see it's five notes going down and two up. Right. This one uh, different. Right. So this one six notes going, uh, five notes going down, two up. Um, and the last note is a different length. Yeah, and uh, different interval as well. So sometimes it's really hard to yeah. Even when people talk about which pattern instances is really what we perceive, there so much uh, different things we consider. Um, I mean, would you say that it's desirable to relate these? Um, I guess I that's depend on what kind of theory. I think when you weigh them one after the other, it really feels like one is it's like a response, it's like a call and response yeah. thing. Yeah. So it does make it would make sense from a theoretical point of view that, that yeah. these two things should be related in some way. Yeah. So if we have a transformation like a call and response, then they will be linked, but it's not really you know it's kind of similarly defined. Like that. Sure.
Question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, so following that train of thought, maybe you can extend your uh, your check to not return a boolean, but more to return a number that tells you how far two patterns are apart. For example, it could count the number of transformations that you needed to apply, like a minimal diff, uh, like a yeah, yeah, minimal like diff length or something, or weighted yeah. by yeah. what yeah. transformation is, makes how big a change. And then you could say, well, this has a big distance and uh, bigger than. So like so we'll, have a, we'll have a similar notion there. That that's the uh, percentage, uh, the approximate checker, that we kind of mm -hmm. integrate this value into the, uh, the checks. Yeah, the that's checks. It's similar, but then you need to specify that value up front. And if you say, oh, I'm just going to calculate how far they're apart, apart then I can yeah, maybe both both are equal from a semantic point of view, but maybe one is more. Yeah. Well, do you have anything to do? Well, I think they're equal. Yeah. I guess it's more efficient if you, d if you don't need to really run your query every time you change your sensitivity. Yeah, but we don't care about the thing. <laughs> Okay. We're just meta analyzing the already existing algorithms that are fixed. Okay, so it's a fixed data set. So if you really care, generate the problem in real time. Yeah, so we do have the advantage that we have big enough data that human analysis will be very expensive, but not that big that we need GPUs and uh, really fast computation. Yes. Ah, uh, great, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>